this is a kind of, I would say, experimental program in the present form. We are introducing two new programs. One of them is already has been already officially launched, which is the program uh, our colleague will speak about it. And there is also uh, another program which is not yet officially launched. I'm representing that one. I'm Jozef Laszlowski, professor in the Medical Studies Department at CEU. And we haven't yet made the official announcement of the new cultural heritage program at CEU because we are just waiting in these days the final green light from the accreditation authority which haven't yet arrived, therefore I'm not able to announce officially that we will start this program, but we will soon do. Uh, but we thought that we have got a splendid opportunity here, because we are already working together with various organizations, and we have got already uh, a good opportunity to have public lectures, because we have got distinguished visitors who are dealing with this field. So, I'm just passing the word to the representative of the Association of uh, Cultural Heritage Managers, which is a fairly new organization in Hungary, and which represents, I think, a new direction in cultural heritage studies. So, uh, Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. You can hear me? Yeah? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the great interest and for being here. This lecture. My name is Antonia Imre and I am Vice President of uh, the Association of Cultural Heritage Managers. Um, our association uh, has won a project together with uh, Dr. Spolers and uh, his company Contiki, um, a program uh, which aims to introduce uh, interpretation of her heritage interpretation in Hungary. Um, we will have two trial courses and if you are interested also after this lecture, please free, feel free to apply for those programs. Uh, we will have one uh, in the beginning of the summer and another one which will be sometime in the autumn, <laughs> beginning of summer, end of May, beginning of June. But uh, in case you put your business cards in the next small box over there, uh, we will let you know by email, which is the exact date. <laughs> of the program. Um, and uh, I would like to thank first to Professor Laszlowski and to see you for the opportunity of being here. Uh, and uh, this uh, lecture is um, the first step of our um, common work with the university as well, um, which is to start this project to some degree together. And um, thank you all and uh, enjoy the lecture, and I will give back the word to Professor Laszlowski, who will present our ex um, outstanding speaker for tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the program for today that we have got our guest, Dr. Lars Wollers, who is representing the Kontiki company, and he's also representing this new joint project. Uh, Dr. Wollers has studied I would call it the English Applied Cultural Studies. Uh, of course, we always have got difficulties with translating these kind of names. And he also did his PhD in this field, particularly the, uh, the problem of uh, the national parks, natural parks in Germany, and in which way these parks can be presented for the wider public. From that very period, his main interest lies in this field, what to do with heritage, whether cultural or natural, and not only what to do with them by professionals or for professionals, but I would say much more for the wider public. And this is very much related to the main problem, which will be the focus of this new program, as well in the focus of this lecture, namely heritage interpretation. Uh, obviously, scholars, specialists would interpret heritage sites according to the knowledge, interest, uh, field of studies, but heritage sites are not only for us, but it's for, let's say, for people. 
Uh, but it doesn't mean that all people can have access to these sites, not necessarily just physical access, but different type of access as well. And uh, because of this, one of the key issues of present day problematics concerning cultural heritage, how to present these sites, and there are various means and ways of doing that. One of the most important ones is informal education. Uh, it's not only part of lifelong studying program in general, but it's a different understanding of learning, but not necessarily in a traditional way, sitting in classrooms and suffering boring lectures, but using experience, adventure, personal interest, sometimes even fun can be part of that and it still can be regarded as education. Uh, but how to do this? This is indeed an issue of heritage interpretation. So therefore I'm very glad that we have got a specialist who is also representing a number of associations, European, German and other type, whose activity is focusing on these areas. What to do with these sites? How to do with these sites? And why? actually to do anything with like that. So the floor is yours. We are looking very much forward to your talk. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Laszlowski. Thank you very much for your nice, for your friendly introduction. Thank you too for, uh, to the CEU for inviting us here to come, for giving us the opportunity to present here today. I think it's an excellent site in the middle of Budapest. And we're glad, I can say, Particularly Jan Kölner, we are glad that, uh, that uh, there's uh, such a big interest here. Um, let me start with giving you a brief <coughs> overview of what I'm going to present in the next 45 minutes. That's what I've been told, right? I think Parker is not there, so I'm still on track. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, briefly um, give you a feeling of why I think that this is maybe one of the most important fields <coughs> of future education. Then, as you know, we are at a university here, we have to define. And as it is at universities, there are lots and lots of definitions all over the world. Um, and so I would like to give you two criteria for choosing between all these definitions. Then it's always helpful to have a uh, look to the historical side of a given field and therefore I will introduce you in four phases to the history of interpretation where it comes from and where we are today with interpretation Fourth, um, it's like a second part the second part of the presentation is about some classical authors in this field four classical authors and then that's what we, uh, in discussions, we figured uh, where before I prepared this presentation, um, Kerme uh, suggested that we should also refer to what we are doing, and I call this the real world jobs. So it's not that I worked at the university, did the PhD, trying to apply what I uh, did there, but it's also now we are freelance consultants and. Uh, we are out there doing these things, which sometimes is not so easy as I would like to show you. And we will also, I will also tell you a bit about uh, the workshop contents in that context, which finally we will summarize, I think together we will summarize what we have for you um, during the upcoming workshops and trainings. So one of the most important future fields of education, also here in Hungary, I would say. One reason is simply, you have a huge potential. You have a huge potential of interpretive sites in Hungary. Can you see this from the back? Yeah. Thank you. You have a huge, huge potential of interpretive sites in Hungary. That's the case in most countries, but sometimes we're not really aware of that. So, uh, this, is, this is a quick... If you think there is a little mistake here and there, maybe this is just a quick desktop research from Germany. Um, it's not a rocket science uh, proof of every site here in Hungary. 
But just look at the numbers of visitors in museums. From what we know, uh, your country has something like 10 million inhabitants, right? So if we look at the number of, museum, uh, of visitors to museums, those are already more than 8 million. So only in the museums, statistically, every Hungarian goes there once a year. So I think that already shows that there is some potential. Also, Professor Laskowski was talking about the fun part of life, which we are lucky to uh, be able to find, to find, uh, to find a job in. Um, these places, informal education, interpretation sites, are, at least from what I know from Germany and other European countries, American in America, uh, these are very popular with schools. So if time allows, and if it's possible organizational and financially, organization-wise and financially, schools really love to go to these places. Because, as Professor Slavsky has pointed out, it's all about a real good experience, about immersing in the real thing, not sitting in the classroom and uh, talking things through in theory. So that's the real strength in, for interpretive sites. And the last point here is, what do you think, who cares about our heritage from the age of 20? I would like to answer this question with the following OECD numbers. Basically, nobody cares. <laughs> because if you look at what happens, this is just normal in almost every country, at least in the industrialized countries. The percentage, this diagram shows you the percentage of particular age groups that participate in externally organized learning. So this is a clever formulation for those people who go to school or to university maybe or vocational training, right? I would skip vocational training here because when we talk about real learning about our heritage, then this happens mostly during school time. Later on, it's the mass media, maybe, with doc a documentary or a book. But other than that, hardly anybody from the population is really engaged with heritage, with natural heritage, with cultural heritage, with things like uh, how uh, the political development of a certain country uh, developed um, and what this means today. Uh, about conservation issues, nature conservation issues, and so forth. So, this is, you see Hungary here in orange, it's, it's the column to the right. So it's the same patterns everywhere, as you can imagine. Externally organized learning stops basically with 20, goes a bit on at universities, but then it's over. So if we are serious about conveying um, uh, heritage, then obviously experiential sites like interpretive sites are well positioned. Two criteria for choosing between 1001 definitions. So I've worked at the, univer the University of Hamburg in Germany for 12 years. I'm not going to say for 12 long years because it was a great time, but I know from that time that when you talk to colleagues, it's always good to know their perspective in order to find a common frame of reference. Um, because if you don't have a common frame of reference, or at least some overlap, then you're not talking the same direction. And last but not least in this field, here we have interpretation. There are more than 100 terms out there describing either the, either the same or at least something really similar. In fact, there has even been a so-called definition project, which you can find on the internet. There were, I think, more than two dozen organizations, it was just in North America, so not really uh, internationally, North America, brought together uh, to define common terms um, in order to find some common language. So it's definitely good to 
you know your own theory, to have your own theoretical background, and to uh, to say where you're coming from, but also to be open to others and to understand. So I would define this field with interpretation that it aims to convey meaningful experiences to people in leisure mode. I've written informal education dash interpretation because my theoretical background from, from a theoretical point of view I think informal education makes most sense but that's in a way it's, uh, it's an academic exercise because others can argue very well for maybe another term so I prefer to use this term but especially on an international level I use interpretation because it's quite well established and maybe also because it has an interesting history to which I will come in a minute. Second criterion, who are, you, who are you talking to? Are you talking to academics? Are you talking to the EU because you're looking for some interesting fundraising? Are you talking to visitors? Visitor, visitors hardly know about all these terms. They want a good service, they want a ranger, they want a guide maybe. But they wouldn't come up saying, ah, oh, do we have some good informal education here? Okay. Hardly even in the American countries or in the Anglo-American countries. Because interpretation, you might know this, actually is a translator, which is also has a historical background, which I'm going to show you why this has happened. So almost I've never met an American or an Englishman or from Australia, somebody who who would say, if you say, what's an interpreter? They would say, oh, it's a nature guy. They always say it's a translator. Mm -hmm. Or are you talking to an association? Even then it makes sense um, to uh, be able to find a common frame of reference. There are lots of interpretation associations out there. For example, the International Visitor Study Association. They mostly talk about informal learning or informal education. I don't know what it's like in Hungary, but in Germany there's lots of museum pedagogics or zoo educators or national park educators and they wouldn't look anywhere else so we've worked now, we've trained zoo educators now for three years this project just finished and as soon as you don't talk about animals in cages they are gone they say, oh this is not for us I mean you can talk about basics for guided tours or for a solid uh, flyer um, but as soon as you, lose, as you leave their frame of reference, they're gone. And I think that's a real strength of interpretation and informal education, because these fields, they really look at the whole enchilada. They look at museums and zoos and botanical gardens and all these sites which are listed in the beginning, which I think is important because we can learn from each other and we can uh, also uh, cooperate with, with each other making the whole more than the sum of the parts. The historical part, it's really exciting. Four phases, first phase was rather philosophical. So it started in the North America uh, some 200 years ago and it went on for half a century. And basically it all developed because of the rapid loss of wilderness in the USA since the famous Lewis Clark expedition. So Lewis Clark, I will never really completely understand this phenomenon, but in 1803, uh, this officer, military officer, was asked with, I think, a dozen other uh, expedition members to go from the Mississippi right across the former, totally, 20 years ago, totally unknown, unknown white spot on the, mar on the map to explore it and to check for settlement opportunities, resources, um, natives and so forth. I think this is so astonishing because imagine uh, Denver, Colorado 200 years ago, nothing. Um, Texas, nothing. So lots of huge big cities, the whole infrastructure there, just 200 years. You can imagine what this meant for the native people there and for the cultural heritage uh, that was was actually destroyed during that time too. So, and it was at that time that painters and philosophers they acted as some kind of intellectual counter movement to the rapid destruction of natural and cultural values. 
So by their writings, by their paintings, they tried to make the people more aware what they were actually losing at that time. And they were kind of successful. Because nature at that time was considered to be a base for discussions about ethics and moral in the US. And in a way that's to also the case today when we talk about interpretation. So we want our visitors to enjoy but also uh, to develop an attitude of, um, of supporting uh, conservation issues, for example. So the second phase is called by a man, actually he came from Scotland with his parents, moved to the States, the John Muir phase. And he's really famous in this whole uh, story. He's really famous, last but not least, because he came up with the term interpretation, at least that's where it's tracked back to. He once said, I'll interpret the rocks, learn the language of the storm flock in the avalanche, and I'll acquaint myself with the glaciers and wild gardens and get as close to the heart of the world as I can. I think it's really, really beautiful. So a lot of people who work in this field, they know about this historical connection. And this is supposedly the first time that interpret was used. And you can see that it was meant in a philosophical way. And it meant, I will translate the language of flood storm on the avalanche, right? That's where this connection of translating certain phenomena came from. Uh, he was a very active conservationist, so he wasn't just writing and painting, but he was a very active conservationist, and here with Theodore Roosevelt, they managed to establish the first protected area, the Yosemite Valley area. So we can conclude from the second phase, national parks were established to protect the remaining wilderness. The touristic development of protected areas was started in order to promote conservation efforts. So that wasn't really the, the, the desired outcome of John Muir, but he found that it was necessary to attract people and to make them aware of what's going on outside of the cities. And the term interpretation has its roots in the National Park movement. Uh, the touristic expansion phase goes right into the 60s, where the establishment of the National Park Service that was established in 1916, and it developed very rapidly and very strongly. And together with that, we can see a very strong touristic development of the National Park Service and of its cultural and natural heritage areas. So sometimes people are not aware that the US National Park Service is not exclusively dealing with natural areas, but also very strongly with cultural areas like Mesa Verde or Vupatki National Monument or Alcatraz. That's all under National Park Service supervision. And during that time, interpretation developed into all these tools we know today, like guided tours, exhibits, self-guided trails, digital media, and so forth. So in this phase, interpretation is established is an established term and a service in the National Parks uh, Service. Um, it always goes back to a famous little book called Interpreting Our Heritage from Freeman Till. I'm sure some of you have heard about it. The maturity phase, I think it lasts until today. And um, I just want to point out one uh, development here, and that's that the National Park Service developed basically two centers, which, it, which is only there to offer interpretation services to the whole national parks, national park institutions. So, especially Harpers Ferry Center, I think it's in uh, West Virginia, it offers a number of services like assistance with media development strategies, help with media cost estimates, answers to technical media questions, assistance with the planning, design, development and production of media products, and planning of interpretation, education, and visitor experience. And these are things which we will tackle um, to some degree in our workshops. I'm saying to one degree because planning is, uh, will be one of the emphasis, but we will also uh, deal with 
uh, certain techniques that are uh, common out there, like text design and guided tours and digital media. So I think we can conclude the field of interpretation is still growing and it professionalizes also internationally. This is what we can see here because Köhme has um, taken on the task of establishing interpretation here in Hungary. So it's about uh, professionalization and research, training opportunities and associations. Here's a little list of associations that have developed in the last some 60 years, maybe 50 to 60 years. And what you can see here is we have like in the first, like to the turn of the century to 92, it was basically in the Anglo-American countries, Australia, US, UK, Canada, and Denmark in between in 87. But then in the last 10 years, if we started 2002, 10 to 12 years, we have a rapid development here in Europe with Spain, New Zealand, just checking if you're paying attention, uh, Sweden, Portugal, the establishment of a European association, and last but not least, Hungary. We also uh, know about activities in Slovenia and Bulgaria or Romania, but we don't know when they, uh, if this is really already an established association. But what you can see here is that it's really taking off. <coughs> okay, let me now come to the second part, the classical authors, or real world jobs and the workshops. First, I would like to give you a very brief overview over uh, the, the strengths, strengths of these four authors that I'm going to introduce you a little bit. Um, so, I divided this, what the authors have written in their classical books um, with the help actually of a planning format of one of the authors. So it's John Verka and he says we need to deal with uh, what's going to be interpreted, why, so the specific objectives, what are the potential visitors, who, how, when and where, the actual interpretation, and implementation strategies. And also he says, so what, meaning what about evaluation. I also, uh, I've also uh, included another column here about other specific things uh, these authors are referring to. And last but not least, which I consider extremely important, the experience of the visitor. Uh, I will deal with that a bit more as mentioned in the subtitle title of this presentation. So in, uh, like 20 years ago, Sam Ham, it's still a classic, a book from Sam Ham, Environmental Interpretation um, for people with big ideas and small budgets. It's really good, it's really good concerning the tools. It's a book like this and more than 90% of it is not so much about planning but about self-guided media and guided tools. Like self-guided trails and how to produce uh, flyers and exhibitions and so forth. So that's where he's really good at. Uh, John Verka. It's also a very interesting introduction into planning and evaluation. So John Verka always uh, had a very strong um, emphasis on market research and on evaluation. So that's where he's really good in and in scientific market analysis. So these are also things that at the moment, from my perception, hardly happen in a lot of countries and most um, sites. So for example in Germany, like museums, national parks, botanical gardens, evaluation, you really have to look for it. Although it's so important, I think we don't need to talk about the importance of evaluation, it's really important and it's coming. So especially um, institutions that provide those places, so those sites with fresh money. They want to know what's going on. And at the moment, they only want to know what's going on at the end. But I think we definitely also need to look at um, a target group analysis 
we also need to test things we provide for the visitors. Instead of producing something we receive money for, putting it out and then waiting what happens. Lisa Brochu, she has been one of the former presidents of the National Association for Interpretation in the US, which basically also is the international organization. And um, she's very project management oriented. So you can tell that from her experience probably as president of this association, she's uh, very much down to earth with having um, high expectations, what you can expect from interpretation, I think. Um, so it's real solid project management. For me personally, um, there's something missing like the heart of what we want to achieve with interpretation. But that's my personal experience. Maybe you will come to another conclusion when you read those books. And finally, my favorite, it's from Stefan Mayer. And it's an, ex basically it's exclusively experience driven. So he's really into the experience of the visitor. Which experience do we want the visitor to, to take away who comes to us? And he really says how we can try to do this. He's so fond of experiences because he said that's what people are looking for. Nobody will leave at the, car, at the parking lot leaving the car saying Ah, uh, you know, I want to know the story of this place. You know, nobody. Everybody leaves the car saying, uh, what can we do here? Right? So that's why experiences are so important from the visitor point of view. But they're also important for us, I think, because they communicate best. If you look at research that has been done for schools who have been to such sites, those who had a good experience, who actually did something physically, they remembered much longer in much more details than those who stayed in the classroom or who had a passive guided tour. Um, he looks at the experience from the entrance to the exit and that's what we will do in the workshop actually. Um, mostly referring to this particular approach. I know from being a freelancer that we need to take care of a public funds and that more and more of these places are asked to um, uh, to make their own, to gain their own income, which I think is really a problem. But um, and we keep that in mind. But still, I think it's really helpful to look at uh, the experience of the visitor the way Steve does it. So real workshops. Sam, Han, as I said, it's a real excellent. Tool book, tools book, although it's 20 years old, so for example, digital media don't happen in this book, but it's really good. What we do is we develop texts, we develop self guided trains, digital media products, and we train guides. That's what we do out here. And the workshops provide participants with the skills to develop good, solid interpretive text to set up guided tours of various digital media. And in general, also to turn unusual elements into an interpretive tool. For example, we came up with suggestions for how to use a coffee machine or a tablecloth as an interpretive tool. This can happen. You can become extremely creative if you look at the experience you want your visitor to take away. As long as we look at the product saying, okay, uh, we got money from the state for self-guided trails. That's what happens a lot of time in Germany. So they already have in mind, we, we need a self-guided trail. And then you have a hard time working with this thing, which is at the end supposed to be called a self-guided trail. But you hardly, you hardly ever find a situation where an institution would come and say, we want our visitors to take away this and this. And I would hope that someday we'll get there. John Wilberka, Interpretive Master Planning. Um, what we do, we plan, we develop, and we, we evaluate exhibits. Evaluation can be really exciting, especially when you take into account all the ex existing research which is out there already. We just recently did an evaluation on the main exhibit of one of our national parks, 
and um, we, it was the first time we were able to apply uh, the good exhibit index, which is out there, developed by Beverly Sorrell, a famous uh, researcher from the States. And it's really fascinating what, the, what she came up with, how to do research and to judge whether it's, uh, what kind of exhibit you have. So the workshops will provide participants always with the, also with the skills to develop and conduct their own visitor studies. Lisa Brochu, as I said, more project management oriented. This brings me to a project we are working on currently. This is a, a stone and bronze age graveyard, like 8 hectares, 7 to 8 hectares, I think it is. And it's uh, the biggest of this kind in northern Germany. And uh, here we are. <laughs> And we need to adapt our services to the customer. Which means, in this case, that there is the mayor coming up of the, that particular village saying, OK, uh, we have a problem here because these um, graves are slowly collapsing. But you know, actually, we want to make some money from it. We want some tourist development. So I think if we can match this and stabilize all of this, um, and make it work together with some tourist development, that would be fine. We tried to, in the beginning to pull it more into a, an interpretive uh, development process. Uh, I think that will be the next phase now. So sometimes, for, for years, we really tried to make our customers think first and then decide for a certain tool. And now we are there that we say, okay, um, it's earlier that we decide not to push customers too much. So the workshop also will also provide participants with hands-on training to figure out what is possible in a given site. And this depends on so many groups. On the clients, on the staff, <coughs> the volunteers, the sponsors, the resources, and the visitors, the public. So all of these customers, if you want, need to be taken into account into account when, when you develop um, an interpretive offering. We just had a discussion today, which I think is really great in this context, that your parliament uh, tries to um, make sure that a certain place here in Budapest fits to the national image they want to convey. Is that correct? Is that yeah, the museum ethnographic. Yeah, so the ethnographic uh, museum, you might have heard of that situation, which I think is quite typical. So the ethnographic museum, it seems, from what I understood, it seems that they really want to go forward, do something, also in the outward uh, appearance, and now, unluckily, they are opposite to, to your parliament. The parliament says, mm, this doesn't fit with what we want to convey. So, sometimes there are compromises here. And Steve Mayer, experience driven. In the real world, we develop interpretive master plans. Right now, for example, for one of our national parks, it's the Heinrich National Park right in the center of Germany. And the challenge there is to try to start the planning with a meaningful experience instead of the tools. So we get there, we are asked to come up with an interpretive master plan for an already existing infrastructure. So they have like three guided trails, a huge big canopy walk, a huge big exhibition, they have flyers, they have guided tours, they have everything going on. And now you're there trying to uh, develop the new master plan for the next 10 years. And it's really hard because these people, they have so much work to do, they are totally understaffed, and just the, uh, the other day I had a phone call with the uh, education officer and at some point he said, you know, I think you really want us to think about outcomes and then maybe come up with new structures or even redevelop something. Is that right? And I said, yeah, that's, I think, what you need to do. Because otherwise you can simply you can put your software trail anywhere, but if you don't care about the outcome, you don't really have to care about the interpretation here. 
So I put this friendly, but and I hope that we can we can move these organizations and uh, help them to get to another level together. I would also like to take this example as a concrete example here what we mean with uh, experience so basically this canopy walk consists of the main tower so people arrive down here and it has a 300 meter loop here and 10 years later there was a second loop it's this one when we came in the director of the national park had folders like this he put them on the table saying okay here are the architectural drawings of the canopy wall what do we do with it and so this was a classical situation where they didn't think at all what this massive structure three million euro the first part alone was supposed to accomplish and they already had the drawings and where it was uh, going and so forth what we did with, what we were able to help them was, with was um, if you look from, from space so to say here's the tower and then the first loop was looked like this okay? and this is kind of a little bit simplified um, a little bit. The first layout of the, of the canopy wall. What we said immediately was this is like two meters, right? So from here to there. This is like 300 meter, two meter broad. Immediately, if you look at the experience, if in your mind you watch visitors walking this path, you can immediately see the traffic jam up there, right? Especially when you have guided tours. Today, they expected, over the whole year, they expected 30,000 visitors for the canopy war. Today, it's 300,000. I don't want to know what this would have looked like if they hadn't, and that's what we suggested, they were still able at that planning stage to include platforms. So four platforms, not that large, but afterwards they said that kind of saved us because you wouldn't have been able to do a guided tour up there in such a situation. So that was easy still to do at that point, looking at the experience of the visitor. And the second example is that if you look at the tower, when you approach the tower, so if you look at it not from the top but from the bottom, then this is what the tower looked like in the beginning. Okay? So here's the lookout. It's closed with glass windows. And uh, there's a staircase going all around. Going all around. From the bottom. Um, and that's another example because we said, why do you want to have this roof? We suggested to, to skip it and to have another to have another second outlook, a second platform, which makes double sense because first of all you can have double load of visitors up there, and second, people up there, they're really out there. They feel the air, they feel the heat, they feel the wind, they hear the birds and, and, the, and the, uh, the wind in the trees. So that's what they did. And afterwards they said, yeah, that was a really good idea. So these things can happen if you look at a certain site from an experiential point of view. And not as important as it is from a pure architectural or graphic designer or guided tour or whatever point of view but figuring out what is it you want to accomplish and then work your way towards as much as possible involvement of the visitor experiential involvement 
make him do something with head, heart, hand. You probably know this, these three words. And Steve von Mayer includes do something with his stomach because it's so important. And there are lots and lots of opportunities to include this. I just uh, <clears throat> asked uh, our colleagues here, has anybody of you been to Dubai? Dubai, anybody? Nobody? But you know about Dubai. So it's got huge skyscrapers, money like nothing. Um, and I recently talked to someone who has been there, um, been there for a week. And he said, we did a guided tour. And at the end, our guide said, if you want to try something typical, you can go up to that restaurant. They have a $10 coffee. And the reason why it costs $10 is Dubai, because they put gold powder, real gold powder, on top of the, instead of, instead of cacao or cinnamon or something. You know? I have a photo. If anybody wants to see it later on, I, I was really, I think this, this is so decadent, but I think that's really an essence of everybody who goes there should have a, because then you know, oh, I'm in Dubai, I'm, I'm breaking my gold. And this particular restaurant uses five kilo of gold each year, just this one restaurant, for its gold powder. You know? So I don't think they want to interpret Dubai, but I thought that's, wow, what a big slab. Um, so you don't need so much money, you don't need gold to do this. But if you keep in mind what to do with those places or those things you're offering in terms of eating and drinking with regard to interpretation, then that um, definitely helps you accomplish your outcomes. Okay, uh, I think that's it at this point. And we have a last list of the workshops, seminars, training during our common um, project here. Now, as Antonia said, in early, early summer kind of thing, May or June, and in autumn. So we will have uh, two days of uh, going through planning processes. We will have more or less one day about text design, more or less one day about guided tours, one day about digital media, one day about evaluation. So I talked about a little bit about planning process, but as I said, we do we decided for texts, guided tours, and digital media because these are just classics, especially text design and guided tours. Like every every site has this. Every site has some panels or some flyer or something written. And there is still a lot of potential to improve this, to make it interpretive, as they say. And the same goes for guided tours. So if there's any staff in a given site, on a given site, then usually they offer some sort of guided tours. And also there. There's, I think, quite a bit that could be improved in number of sites. At least that's what my experience is uh, with those places where we are working. Digital media, we've taken this up because you all know the current development, like it or not. We definitely need to be aware of what's coming here and how to make good use of it. And there will be another colleague from England who's going to do this workshop on digital media. And evaluation, I said something in the beginning. That's um, what I know from uh, the Anglo American countries and from Germany, at least from those countries, I can say that it's definitely coming. And more and more places know that, oh, we need to do this. I don't know, for example, for ICOMOS, the association you're working for, um, if this is a matter. We have a special committee on that. A special committee on evaluation. Yeah. So yeah, that's yeah, yeah, international thing. Yeah, international. So it's the same with zoo educators, it's the same with protected area association, Europark. So evaluation is really uh, becoming more and more important. Oh, all right. And in the end we have four days of excursions too. Maybe Antonio you can say something about it. Yeah? Thank you very much, Lars. Um, first, I would like
like to say that uh, we are uh, an associ association, uh, me, my colleague Arpad and uh, there is Pirushka in the back. Uh, three of us, we are willing uh, to answer all your questions. Also, I think that Dr. Wallace will ask, answer your questions after this lecture. And uh, With pleasure. And Jusha. Uh, and I'm sorry, and also our colleague Shusha. Uh, excuse me, Shusha. <laughs> so all of us, we are willing to answer your questions. Uh, we are willing to send you any uh, materials with more details regarding the program. So I don't take the time now to explain every detail of our program. The program is designed to be uh, quite interactive. Uh, all the pro program will be uh, placed each day, maybe in a different location, different site, uh, which is uh, in partnership with us. Um, it can be um, interpretive site, by all means. Uh, um, maybe it can have a classroom session, but uh, we are still negotiating whether to have it or not. Um, the idea is that every day we can go out to the site where we are, have a look and work with the content we see, all the participants. Uh, then um, it's, uh, we will have two kinds of participants, um, mainly one are those who are our academic partners and are interested to work and to continue this program with us. Uh, the other part of participants are people, maybe like majority of you, who are working in real life situation and in real projects, in real sites. And for you, we would like to offer the opportunity to work your own project during the, the course. So we would like to have as much real projects as we have. So this is one of the most important aims we would like to, to do with the course. We don't want to give just the theoretical knowledge. We would like you to have something you can take and realize later on on your side. And um, last but not least, uh, we have uh, to develop to complete the course uh, some, some other group projects which are related to um, excursion sites, also our partners who are uh, not directly in the past but close by. Um, I don't name all the partners now, but I'm very uh, open to, 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 to give you more details later on who, who are we working with and what are the ideas. So, thank you very much. Questions? Questions? And, yes, and we are waiting for the questions. Thank you. Does anybody have a question or a comment? Mostly comment. Okay. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to sleep with you, but... Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. It was really interesting. My uh, first uh, remark was that, okay, where are the historic monuments? Monuments and sites. So we are dealing mostly with, uh, with the national parks and, and the zoo and another kind of of uh, most nature heritage. So, do you have any special uh, comments uh, concerning buildings and ensembles of Eastern movements or it's more or less similar? Sorry, the last sentence. And if I have any. Uh, historic monuments, ensembles, sites, group of buildings. So, it's, it's more built heritage. It's my interest mostly. Right. And maybe it's, it's more or less the same, but maybe you have. Any additional comments to do for that? Mm. Well, from my point of view, it is as you say, it's, um, it's very, very similar. So if we look at uh, the planning process we are using, it doesn't differ from a natural heritage site. So we look at the welcome situation, we look at uh, the orientation situation, we look at uh, how to create a strong message, we look at the image a certain site wants to convey. We look at how to organize this so that the visitor takes away what uh, the intended outcome is. And we look at what makes a good experience. And uh, these things uh, don't 
don't differ from natural to cultural heritage. So that's why. Okay, it, I almost agree with you, but uh, you know the, the, the culture heritage always has a very strong uh, connection with history. Yeah. And maybe it's it's only uh, relevant in our region, but history sometimes uh, produces uh, how to say delicate issues, which are concerning also concerned also heritage. So there are sensitive questions how to how to present or interpret make an interpretation of a, a special site which is maybe has different meaning for different ethnic groups and so on. So I, I think nature is much more uh, easier. I wouldn't agree. <laughs> look, at, look, at, uh, look at national colors. Look at national colors. So what you will find all over the world, everybody loves national colors as long as they as people don't live close to them. Those who live close to them you will always find resistance in people who, who don't want it and so forth. So to, um, ideas like nature conservation or uh, Europark says, uh, the German Europark Foundation created this, I think it was uh, who said, let nature be, late, be nature. So that we should have more wilderness. So that's a very um, controversial topic there. But I do understand your, your point. I perfectly understand your point. Um, for example, uh, our, our history in Germany, the history of the last century is a very delicate history. And, but it's not, our, it's not ours to, um, to suggest in a workshop what to do about it, but to support participants uh, to do it in a way that it can be um, applied to different target groups with different points of view. Uh, so maybe the question referred more about the examples, but you showed just you okay. didn't explain so much about, let's say, the water tower okay. example, which is a historical building in your network, or uh, there is the graveyard project you're working. So mm -hmm. there are the, some some built heritage or cultural heritage uh, projects from your background and mm -hmm. you can say a couple of words more regarding those projects because maybe the examples were more about the natural okay. parks and yeah. just, just maybe this more complex. The Mediterranean and they have the so-called damusos which are uh, typical historical buildings it's a very special architecture that you will only find on that particular island so we worked together, and those were part of a protected area, but they wanted to show the um, kind of the interface of the natural and cultural development of this island, which goes hand in hand. And like a great example of what happened when nature and culture merged on such a place, on such an island, were these tamusos, because they were made from natural materials, they uh, were done in a way that they worked, uh, in terms of the, of the climate inside the buildings, the water supply, and so forth. So, in most cases we find, except when we have, but even then, when we talk about wilderness areas, in most cases, at the same time, it's also a cultural issue. It's not just either nature or culture. Although we do have, the, this is our major background. Yeah. I'm not sure if that answers your Partially, yes. Partially. We do have also a special charter for heritage interpretation in e-commerce, so called Enama Charter, which is like this. And it is a case inversion. The archaeological presentation part is something like this. And of course, this very charter deals with more specifically with, with, with build heritage issues. So I, I'm really happy to be here and uh, to learn a lot from this presentation. But I have still have the feeling that uh, it would be very much interesting to, 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 to add specificities uh, as for built heritage. Okay. 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 I can only say that from our experience, it, it doesn't matter, for example, if we talk about um, a building that's um, conserved due to its uh, cultural value and where there is a a uh, national park exhibit inside and then in that case you have to deal with both the building itself 
international power and see how we can make this work too. But if we, we look at things like Balkan situation and orientation and messages, so next up, those I would consider basics for every side. Maybe build it, building or natural side.
who are professionalists, uh, professionalists? Uh, in the field of designing out, uh, experiences that create the outcome as much as possible that a given site has in mind. And uh, that's definitely a huge, if you consider that way, that's definitely a huge big challenge for the future, I think. Because from our experience, it's the case that you can, can get a great flyer and you can get a great exhibit here and an interactive device and an app and a guided tool. But how this interrelates and how this fits to the motivations and desires of the visitors um, often is not answered when those places are built, for example, when, when you have a building. So one place where we were working was um, the um, biggest, the new maritime ocean museum in Germany. And there has been, as most, in most cases, when lots of millions of euros are involved, there has been an architectural competition. And in this case, they uh, decided for, um, for a building where, and I, from my point of view, <laughs> you understand this, they created a situation in which the architect, for example, has the right to say, on this table, you're not allowed to put a brochure. You're just allowed to put brochures there. Because on that table, it would interfere with the atmosphere I want to create here. So the, the, uh, the architects have a real big saying there. Um, and that's what I think. I agree with Steve, honestly, that we need people who, who have a new angle to look at these situations. Master plan for 
about the five year or six year, I don't know exactly. But um, from the point of view as a historian or somebody who's interested in really the cultural um, aspect of the of, of historical side, there are, there's film, uh, film screening going on, there's a lot of um, um, like contemporary uh, sculptures in, in, in the Baroque uh, interior. And like, it's a matter of taste as well, but that was an example to me which like it went too far. So if like, I just wanted to point out this problematic aspect of, the, of looking at these sites from the economic point of view. And the question for, um, in general, about this new profession of interpreter, in, interpreters, so I don't know what would you call it, well, how would you make a difference or how would you define it in, in comparison to curators? Um, and you mentioned that if you see it as a new profession, why like you were saying that it's rather a platform of which different professionals and professionals can interact. So uh, I'm a bit confused. I, 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 I like the concept, and I know I, I, I think that it's important to look at these uh, sites from the experience of visitors, especially from um, adult uh, education perspective. So there you have these basic points of of uh, main message, what you want this visitor to take away from this site. And uh, do you need to have a new profession for this, or do you need somebody who is working, who's, who's a museologist, who's a, I don't know, employed at that certain site to think about it? Or do you see it as an advisor and a consultancy? Is it a new profession, or is it just another aspect of the existing professions? Yeah. Well, if you go through Stephen Mayer's works, he's published a number of books. And he's well known as a provocateur. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but, but that's why I'm saying it. He's, uh, uh, he's not rarely, he's exaggerating and um, to a certain degree provoking in order to make, make a certain point. I, I would say I agree with him that a new profession would be great. But I also agree with, that, uh, with the idea that this cannot exclusively happen in a new profession, but that uh, it can be done by, by existing professionals, sure enough. So it's not a matter that a curator cannot learn this or something. So that's that's not the idea. It's just the point is that um, the point is to give it more attention, to give it more attention, to look at it as much as possible at the beginning and not at the end, as here, for example. Yeah. So that's that's the old point. May I answer you as well? Uh, I think there was a bit of maybe I did not express myself uh, properly when I told the economic perspective. I didn't mean the number of visitors. I meant what the visitor needs, mm -hmm. and I meant the experience the visitor take away. And it is the informal education also which Lars started there, like uh, his lecture with. So if you start from what the visitor really needs or what, 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 he, what is his or her motivation when he goes to a site, then you change a little bit your perspective, also like historian. Take an example of, of, of a historical heritage you want to preserve, but it's always a question whose heritage it is, right? So you want to, the people to, to feel it a proper heritage, or at least in the well-working society, there is a community behind the heritage. It's not just something that you go and visit and you check on your checklist that I said, I, I have seen the next uh, uh, World Heritage Site. But you feel that it is something that belongs to you, right? As community. Let's say Hungarian National Heritage something very important in, let's say, Visegrad castle. You, you are proud of it as Hungarian that, yes, this is the King Matthias um, castle. And you feel some, some kind of, or maybe you, I, I don't know, I'm not Hungarian myself, so maybe it's not the best example I can give, but, but, but then there, there is something that you, you have some feeling to. It's something that makes you proud. This is the greatest king of Hungary, and, and, and yes, I know what it is, and I'm, I'm happy to be here. And, and then if you, we, we look at your, exp, your expectation, why you go there, and what you want to do there, uh, then you will have a totally different takeaway uh, from visiting this site. That's maybe the only idea. Or like historian, how you want to involve kids in what they are seeing, right? Or in school, school, school children, what they are seeing. Uh, it is the 
marketing concept, it is a marketing strategy, it is something different. A uh, marketing strategy starts from what consumer wants to, to uh, what's the need of the consumer. Well, isn't it adult education mm -hmm. subject, you mm -hmm. want to teach them something, so your perspective is... Uh, but the people they don't go because business. they want to learn something, that is also what Lars said. They, want, they visit the site because they want to have fun or they, they want to spend some great time, not because they want to learn the history of Hungary in that particular site. They just want to feel well and this is the need of the customer that we have to fulfill as a visitor site. So when he comes, we can informally educate him without him getting it very much to take notice. And this is notice. Conscious when I was pointing out that the visitor's expectation of too much Marketize and fun, you know, fun being online, and and your um, agenda as a curator, as a historian, as an archaeologist, as a geologist, that is something that these two might be in contrast, or they might be problematic. And just, I mean, I'm, I'm okay, 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 maybe, just maybe wanted to point out the, the contrast, and the, that this is really the nice we're working on sometimes. It, it definitely, yes. it definitely yes. is, and it's good you're making this point because there are more and more uh, tourist attractions like. Uh, Right now we have a volunteer from uh, Austria, and she brought us this flyer from from some very fancy technologically based uh, visitor attraction, Vienna something. Has anybody been there? And she said, "Has anybody been there? It must be a big, big place. It's very costly, and you go there and there's." Lots of fun stuff going on. Everything so technologically based. I think it's a 3D cinema, and they have uh, lots of fancy uh, film techniques and so forth. But they just seems as if they more or less pick some major events in the history of Vienna. But they don't really dig into what are the major points we want to make here. And so I totally agree that this is thin ice, and um, especially when when uh, digital media stuff is involved and you need to be careful because I know from from sites where they included uh, like 5D cinemas and it's revealed that people go there because they want to be in this fancy uh, film theater but not because they uh, they don't go there anymore because of the experience of being uh, in this particular heritage site Visitors want or how they would like to enjoy themselves. 
because if we simply follow this, and I think it's for the economic point as well, then you would say nowadays people only need shopping centers. Okay? So if I look into their needs, that means we have to transform our heritage sites into shopping centers. <laughs> Surely they like so the if I simply yeah. accept the costumer attitude as the ultimate driving force, then we only create Disneyland and shopping center today. Or maybe we accept that first, perhaps there are people who does not need this or not only this. The second. Maybe you can take a more active role in that one and not simply accept that. Mm. No, you're perfectly right. And obviously, I didn't make that point. But when I said that in terms of experience, we are looking at head, heart, hand, and stomach. So these are definitely, the idea is definitely to engage the visitor as actively as possible. And sometimes this activity consists and having a drink that composes the essences of a given place because it goes back to some we had that it's a historical recipe maybe a historical recipe of a certain meal yeah and maybe they even prefer prepare that but um, as much as possible we try to involve the participants which is really a tough job nowadays because a passive marketing economy is uh, very widespread. So I wouldn't say that we need to listen to every wish of the visitor, but that we need to be familiar with uh, not so much with their. We don't have to fulfill every wish, but we would have to fulfill their needs. So their needs is for some uh, um, for some uh, sensorical experience. They definitely need information. They are mostly looking for something to eat or drink. And most of them are also looking for something to do. That's why all these interactive uh, objects are so popular. Although most of them are not really interconnected. So it's not, so much, not only a matter of kids, involving kids interactively, but also adults. Yeah. So I really agree. <coughs> I would like to reflect also to this point because there is another view of, of uh, visitor involvement. Uh, for example, at the beginning, <coughs> when we developed uh, the subtitle of this uh, lecture, there was a subtitle like this, uh, Creating uh, Experience uh, for Visitors. And after that, we changed it to Creating Experience with Visitors. Because, because we, we think that it's, a, it's a really important not to involve them uh, related to their expectations, but also uh, involve them uh, related to the uh, production of the final product. So the, uh, the last year, uh, the Interpret Europe uh, conference was, uh, I, I, in my meaning, that was about uh, this side of interpretation, how to involve people to create good uh, interpretation. And there are many uh, examples 
related to this topic, I think. So we deal with it as a... There is a nice one sentence definition of experience from Aldous Huxley. He said, experience is not what happens to you, but what you do with what happens to you. And that's what we are trying to aim for. To give people as much as possible something to do. And even if it was just to really think about things, not to passively linger around, but to really take things in. It and after that. Yeah. And we, we should. Yes. I, I think yes. I would like to suggest that we finish stop with one part of the program now. Yeah. I think we should thank again Dr. Lars Holler for the presentation. I am grateful to the members of the association, bringing him to see you with this organization. So
some suggest that we can continue in an informal way. Surely you can answer more questions about the practicalities and maybe our speaker can answer also some other types of questions. So thank you very much, thank you for coming and we hope that it's just the first element of the program which will be soon launched and we will get more information. Thank you very much. Thank you.